You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Welcome back, pithy listeners. We hope you had a spooktacular October and enjoyed our ghoulish tales. And this week, too, we will begin in the realm of myth and legend before diving into the clear blue waters of Hawaii and its sacred ali'i, or royalty. This episode is going to be a two-parter. This week, we will discuss the rise of the Hawaiian monarchy, And next week, you might have guessed it, we'll cover its fall. Keep up with us on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook so you don't miss an episode. And you just might find some historical comic relief to spice up your day. All right, it's story time. Long before the written word reached Hawaiian shores, history was told through song, dance, and chant. And it all began with the kumulipo, a three-hour chant that starts at the very beginning of the world and ends with the powerful Hawaiian chiefs. Holy cow. Right, three hours, good lord. That's like ring cycle level. (laughs) I was thinking that too. According to the legend of Kumulipo, in the beginning, there was utter darkness named Papahanamoku, mother of the gods, the earth, and the underworld. There was also light from Wakea, or Father Sky. Together, Mother Earth and Father Sky created a world of opposites, light and dark, land and sky. And their daughter, Ho'oho Kukulani, created the stars. But soon, Wakea's eyes began to wander, and eventually his desire for his own daughter, Ho'oho Kukulani, led to the premature birth of an unformed fetus named Kalo. The devastated parents buried Kalo in the earth. Happily, the daughter-father pair had a second child who was healthy and strong, Haloa. Haloa became the first man on the newly formed earth and the first ancestor of the Hawaiian people. As Ali'i Nui, or high-ranking chief, he started the dynasty of Hawaii's royalty, and every Hawaiian chief after could trace their lineage back to the demigod. But what of the first brother, Kalo, buried in the ground? From his grave grew the taro plant, a starchy root similar to the potato and the main food source of the Hawaiian people. So the first son fed the people, and the second led them into the future. Now, Caroline, I recognize that you really like incest. Like, don't like it, but like it. But like, Oh, girlfriend, I even have a whole portion about incest <laughs> coming up. Okay, because I was going to say, this is... I mean, father-daughter incest is... Yeah, it's a, it's a story. But think about the Greek myths. Yeah. Venus, you know, the goddess of love, was actually born of the foam of the sea after her father, Uranus, was overthrown and then castrated by his son, Saturn. Uh. So, Roman myth, things get weird, things get wacky. I think we find that in almost all creation myths. It's not just because it's this myth. I would have called it out because we have been so incest heavy, I feel like, this season. Oh, oh! then this is the perfect episode to continue the incest All right. love. I don't want to say love of incest, but we're certainly going to address it because it's a large part of the Hawaiian monarchy tradition. <laughs> yes, I said that. Well, <laughs> as this story suggests, Hawaiians respected genealogy. They cared about who you were related to. Who was dad? Who was mom? That was very important. Coming from the South, who are your people? I get it. Who are your people? Yeah, if they had had 23andMe back then, holy cow. Hmm. This would have been a huge hit. Ancestry.com would have exploded. So the chiefs were all descended from Haloa, or the gods, and it was their royal blood which gave them their sacred power. Historians estimate that the Hawaiian Islands were first settled as early as 400 CE. Mm -hmm. Polynesians from the Marquesas Islands, more than 2,000 miles away, traveled in canoes seeking a better future. Or, as Moana says, 
They were voyagers. Moana also features pretty heavily on the Chronicle. Chronicles. Well, I got little kids. Yeah. Gotta make it relevant. Excellent. So, without a written language, much of their history was lost. But through their cultural chants, songs, and dance, the stories remain. I'm all here for the oral tradition. I'm ready for it. Are you saying you're all about oral? (laughs) And moving on. (laughs) So we know that each island was ruled by individual chiefs who traced their noble blood back to the beginning, back to Haloa. The warring chiefs, or kings, administered their own lands while continually fighting for more because each felt that their own godly connection, their royal lineage, was obviously the strongest. Wow, nothing changes across time or cultures. It does not matter where you are. It's unbelievable. So despite the constant warfare, Hawaii itself was pretty much a paradise. I mean, I think we all know that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Even with intermittent volcanic eruptions and earth tremors, it was an easy place to live. Always warm, with lots of food, plenty of fresh water, and the cooling trade winds. Palm, hala, and mulberry trees provided food, shelter, even clothing. And the people, ruled by gods, lived according to kapu. So, aside from me wanting to go get my hula skirt out and go lay on a beach... You want to lay on a beach in a hula skirt? I'm just... The tan lines. I mean... Dreadful. Fine, 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 fine. I just want to go to a resort with a cabana and a coconut. And no children. That sounds great. And no great. children. Yeah. And alcohol. So beyond the idyllic setting and me trying to run away, uh, what is Kapu? Well, Kapu is not idyllic. It would not make for a great vacation, especially for you. Oh. It is the Hawaiian Code of Conduct that preserved the necessary distance between chief and commoner. And how do you know I would be a commoner in this situation? Well, you also would be a woman, oh. and that would not bode well for you. Fair. Just wait. Okay. Yeah. Great question, but also, are you descended from Haloa? Who knows? Well... I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> your Scottish ancestry and multiple witches from your past <laughs> say No, otherwise. I would probably be an outcast, and they would probably stone me quickly. They do do that, so that could happen. <gasps> Whoops. There okay. we go. So Hawaii at the time was a very stratified society from the high ranking class of the ali'i or the nobles to the commoners or maka'enana. Everyone knew their place and followed the rules and there were oh so many of them. I mean the people needed incredible memories because of course they couldn't write anything down. They didn't have a written language. So are we talking... Sun King Versailles level that many. That's a great, I I thought about that comparison. It is similar to Sun King Versailles level of nitpicky. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like, that. but the the consequences could be deadly. Right. It's not just we're gonna take your livelihood or you don't get to come watch the king poop. It's we're gonna kill you. Yeah, you definitely didn't get to watch the king poop. Well. <laughs> Because you couldn't look at him. Hold on, we'll get there. Kapu dictated everything from sex to food, ceremony to fish. It restricted contact with chiefs and other people of spiritual power. And it separated men and women. Not only were they required to eat separately, but women were not allowed to ingest the godly foods, such as pork, bananas, coconuts. I mean, like, those are the three best things. Yep. They, but, they, but also, like, if they don't eat that, what are they Oh, hold on. We're going to get there. Hold on. Hold okay. on. Okay. 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 They also weren't allowed to eat the main food source of the islands, which was taro, because that was the fetal brother buried in the ground. In fact, taro was so sacred that women couldn't even prepare it. Um, I'm sorry. Women couldn't prepare it? It's a, a, a fetus. Like, who else would be qualified? It makes me think of Harry Potter when they pull that the, the mandrake. mandrake. It looks like that. But my point is... If the origin is supposed to have been a miscarriage or a fetus, who better to prepare it than a woman? It certainly isn't a man that's going to suffer from that. True. And yet... And yet... Here we are. Here we are. If they can't eat the taro, they can't prepare the taro... Can't eat the big fish. No coconut. No banana. No pork. Yeah. None of that. So what do they eat? Seaweed, from what I've heard. Is that it? The Hawaiian culture relied on seaweed more than any other Polynesian diet, mostly because they had to give something to the women. 
I mean, were these women just tea tiny little slips? Oh no, they were not. The larger, the better, my love. No, so no, no, no. So how did they no. get large? They could eat if some just things. Eating seaweed. They could eat some okay. things. I, little fish, chickens, other plants. Well, but but they weren't eating the good stuff is what is what we really need to clarify here. And it's all because of this Kapu system of who could do what, when and where. Kapu was incredibly rigid and the intricate rules, as I said, were not taken lightly. Death was a common punishment for breaking the rules. So let's look at an example. Commoners were not allowed to look upon someone of noble rank. Ali'i Nui, who were the highest ranking chiefs on the individual islands, were so closely related to gods that everyone else, from commoners to even lesser ranked nobles, must immediately lie face down in the ground when in their presence. I mean, that's downright biblical. It is. It is. It's like prostrating themselves. Yeah. To help out, the highest chiefs would actually usually travel by night to prevent accidents, quote unquote, wherein an unsuspecting commoner would unintentionally just happen upon them and thus pollute the chief's nobility. I mean, I guess that's kind of considerate. Kind of considerate, but if it was an accident or not, breaking kapu meant death. And so the unlucky commoner would be immediately killed. My lord, do you just- Just for looking at him. I feel like I would just look at the floor all day. So from what I read, they lived in very different parts of the island. Mm. So the chiefs did not just walk freely to the marketplace. They had a very different and secluded area, which is why when they traveled, they would try to do it at night. Okay. But yeah. You know, if you happen to see it, it's basically like a human sacrifice, which also was a not common, but certainly not uncommon thing in the Hawaiian culture at the time. Because by violating kapu and looking upon the demigod or high chief, the commoner then struck down that hierarchical difference between the sacred and the profane. And so the king, to purify himself, must destroy the transgressor to, you know, keep his holiness pure so like how long did this go on like is this about a thousand years okay this was their thing they had kapu Uh, you know i don't want to get into all the details of it because it, it does apply to today's episode but it's not the point of it but you can go online and have a field day looking at all the rules and of course they weren't written down so they are told via legend, chant, etc. But they were a very rigid system that the Hawaiian people, I don't want to say cherished, but relied upon to kind of keep society together. The chiefs especially needed this to make sure they got to stay at the top and other people were at the bottom. But more than that, I think it gave the culture a bit of certainty, a bit of... Humans love order. That's right. We naturally tend toward it. And no matter if you were at the top or the bottom, at least you knew where you stood. Okay. But change was on the horizon. Great. For the women, thank God. (laughs) In the winter of 1778, the refreshing trade winds of the Pacific blew the HMS Resolution and its crew, commanded by the famous explorer Captain James Cook, to Hawaii's shores. Though his first encounter with the island archipelago was very brief, Captain Cook returned the following year in 1779, sailed around the island chain for eight weeks, and then landed on the big island of Hawaii. There he remained for about a month, and he was honored with a visit by King Kalaniopu'u, who ruled Hawaii and the Hana district of Maui. So at this time, each island was ruled by its own chief and had its own stratified community. And they were still warring, but it was pretty evenly divided island by island. However, tensions began to rise. Though the Ali'i, or the nobles, the highest nobles, respected and welcomed Cook and his crew, the inadvertent breaking of Kapu, wherein British sailors unknowingly took wood from a sacred Hawaiian burial ground, led to disaster. Uh, yeah, I bet it did. And it's not like they could walk into Hawaii and they'd be like, oh my gosh, sorry, here's our pamphlet of rules. Be sure to follow them. Yep. You know, this would be so different for a British explorer to just step into this world or a British sailor and have all these new regulations. And they didn't know that they were breaking them. Right. But it was gonna hurt. Mm -mm. So in response to stealing the sacred wood, the Hawaiians then stole one of Cook's small boats. And thus Cook, in his infinite wisdom, decided to kidnap 
and ransom the old king Kalaniopu'u for the return of his boat. Yeah, that seems that seems rational and even. Yeah, a boat for a person. Yep. And a king, no and less. And a king, no less. It shows confidence on Cook's part of where he felt he was in this pecking order. Yep. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yep, it's, it's very um, domineering. Yeah. Cook marched through the village to find the king, took him by the hand, and led him away. Oh, that is touching. Touching. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's not going to turn out well for him. No, if you can't look at someone, you certainly him can't is... touch him. No. And hand holding does not strike me as something you do with the king. I wouldn't think so. I mean, also, what a pathetic ransom. <laughs> like, come on, dude, let's go. Cook didn't understand the delicate and detailed world of Kapu, and thus his actions were viewed by the Hawaiians as dangerous. Right. A kahuna, or priest, began to chant, and that called a large crowd to form around them. Captain Cook was unaware of the severity of his transgression, although I would think kidnapping any person would be not a great plan. And while he turned to launch his boats, he was struck on the back of his head with a heavy club before being stabbed to death. Yep, yep. Honestly, though, maybe not the worst way. We've we've had some pretty gruesome ways to go. It could be worse. It could be worse. It could be worse. And frankly, the Hawaiians did human sacrifices in worse ways. Yeah. So it could have been worse. It could have been worse. But, you know, this is a very famous man just brought down because he touched someone. Slash tried to kidnap him. But <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be a butt. Maybe you shouldn't be a butt. There you go, Captain Cook. Mm-hmm. Just because I want to make sure we're fair, four Marines were also killed and two others wounded in this little skirmish. Oh, I don't dear. know how their deaths went, I'm sorry to say. So despite the murder of Captain Cook, the leader of the expedition on the HMS Resolution, the Hawaiian people, and the ruling class especially, saw the opportunities that were offered by continued relations with the West. And thus, they did prepare Cook's body with traditional Hawaiian funerary rites, to include disemboweling and baking his body to remove the flesh, and then the bones were cleaned and preserved as religious icons. Like medieval holy relics? That's the- Very similar. Yeah. Here is the bone of a saint. Here is the tibia of Captain Cook. Of Captain Cook. Cook. Uh, Also, I would like to say that, what is that conversation? Oh, guys, this was a really great interaction. I think that we can do this again. Um, Maybe they'll bring a new- (laughs) New ch- new ship. I don't know how new they people. manage to new ship. Come back. Actually, people return. We're going to talk about him in a minute, but there was a a man who was on the ship who returns about 10 years later and starts a very prosperous relationship with the Hawaiian people. So this did not scare them off. So either Hawaii was that much of a paradise or maybe I think there was some Oopsie, we didn't mean to kill your captain, but he was trying to steal our chief. And then the the Brits were like, oopsie, we didn't understand Kapu, but we got it now. We'll just call this even and we'll move on with our day. I still think it's weird, but okay, go ahead. Or maybe not weird, but the logic is not point A to point B. There's some scribbling along the way. There had to be some inner workings along the way. They did, however, give back some of his body for a Christian burial, let's see. But not all of it. Yeah. You gotta keep you know. your trophies. Oh! oh. <laughs> so while this interaction with the West, as we said, didn't exactly end well, it did open the islands to outside influence for the first time in more than a thousand years. And interestingly, unlike many other quote unquote discovered islands, you know, when Westerners would come and find a new place that we thought had been undiscovered, similar to maybe Japan with its isolationist approach to foreigners, Hawaii generally embraced new visitors and didn't kill many more of them. (laughs) You know what I mean? Oh, oh, I got the joke. I think, I I don't know that I thought it was funny, but that's... (laughs) And one man in particular shaped the <laughs> island's future. Kamehameha I, frequently called Kamehameha the Great, was born around 1758. I've seen some things that say 1736, and I've seen some dates as late as 1760, so we'll just go ish. He is a circa baby, a male circa baby. Ooh, love that. Mostly because he wasn't born to the throne and they didn't have a written language. Oh, he wasn't born to the throne. That sounds. Oh, that sounds. Isn't this exciting? Fascinating. He was born nephew to King Kalaniopu'u of the Big Island, Hawaii. 
And though the king's eldest son, Kiwala'o, was heir to the throne, Kamehameha was a respected member of the family and the king's confidant. In fact, it was Kamehameha who accompanied his uncle to meet Captain Cook when the British explorer first landed on Hawaiian shores. I do not know if he was present for the death. Mm. King Kalaniopu'u honored his nephew with a very prominent religious position. He gave him custody of the Hawaiian god of war. That really meant that he was in charge of the temple and that he made sure the god was venerated and respected. But Kamehameha began to flex his newfound authority. And when a captured rebel chief was brought to the war god's temple to be sacrificed, the heir to the throne, Kiwala'o, came to the war god's temple to perform the ritual sacrifice for his ailing father, the king. However, after beginning the ritual, Kiwala'o was interrupted by the cocky Kamehameha, who took the slain body from his cousin slash soon-to-be king and finished the ceremony himself. I can't imagine that went over well. No. Would you do this to the soon-to-be king? I would not. I, I would not. No. Kiwala'o was not thrilled. In fact, he was he was pretty pissed. Shocking. And he never forgave his insolent cousin. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I'd be pissed. Kiwala'o was already... People weren't sure about him taking over. He had a younger brother that people liked a lot more. Mm. He just was kind of weak, people felt. So the fact that his cousin was able to just interrupt him well, did not yeah, bode well I mean, for his rule. And I think he definitely saw it as a message that Kamehameha was definitely sending. And you know good and well, people started to talk and said, mm, mm -hmm. he took that dead body out of your hands. And what How did can you, you possibly do? be a good ruler now? What did you do? You didn't slay him. You didn't kill him. You just let him do it. The dying king, Kaliana Opu'u, actually feared for his nephew life. He thought maybe his son would try to kill him. And so he sent him away for his protection, where he lived with his family on a different island, tending to the war god and kind of biding his time. As one biographer said of Kamehameha, quote, true kings are seldom satisfied to take second best. Uh, yeah, that rings true. But why give him the war god? That just seems a little too symbolic. Well, Kamehameha was a wonderful warrior. It does feel like the uncle was setting his son up for failure, mm. I think. Yeah. But the problem is that Kamehameha is not of the highest ranking nobility. He is not the perfect blood ruler. The son is. And so... The but Hawaiians... you're still giving him the god of war to tend. Don't you think that deity is going to rub off a I little bit? I think he was hoping that would satisfy the nephew. Mm. That it would be, I respect you. I know you're a warrior. I'm giving you this. But you know you can't have more. Except upon the old king's death. His son and heir, Kiwala'o, immediately allied himself with an uncle and a half-brother and then intentionally provoked a quarrel with his rival, Kamehameha, leading to the Battle of Moku Ohai. And as you've likely guessed, Kamehameha was victorious and Kiwala'o was killed. Kind of brought that on himself. Yeah, I mean, if he's not provoking you, maybe you should just let him be. But Kamehameha did not stop there. <gasps> he continued fighting. He battled the chiefs of Maui, Lanai, and Molokai. He didn't want just one island. He wanted them all. With an armada of 960 war canoes, and let me tell you, I love the idea. War canoes? The visual of war canoes in an armada. Yes. And 10,000 soldiers, Kamehameha won a decisive battle on the island of Oahu in 1795. Armed with traditional Hawaiian spears as well as muskets, he pursued his enemy until they were trapped on a mountaintop. And their choices were surrender or jump. Mm. Or be pushed, which may or may not have happened. Again, not a bad way to go considering. I guess, yeah. It was a thousand foot drop to their deaths and over 400 men either jumped or were forced off said cliff. Yeah, I mean. It would be splat. Imagine the cleanup terrible. from that. Terrible. They just probably let the water do it. But I guess. I guess I'd rather jump off a cliff than be boiled alive. Yeah, that's true. I don't think anybody can beat Vlad the Impaler. 
We could have some sort of a survey and ask our listeners, but so far, yeah. he wins ha- most evil. Ways to go. Ways to go. Oh, that would be hilarious. We should do that. <laughs> Historical ways to go. Iron Maiden, impaling, boiled Blood alive, eagle. drowned in a vat of wine, which we've seen more than once. Yes. So here he comes. He won this decisive battle, kills more than 400 men off of this cliff. And by 1810, Kamehameha had all of the Hawaiian islands within his kingdom. And he did that for the last few with peaceful agreements because, you know. Yeah, I don't want to jump off a thousand foot cliff. Start with force, end with peace. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you make one big statement, then you don't necessarily have to resort to that for the rest. He brought the drama for the first bit, and then everyone else was like, just kidding. Welcome. So that is how Kamehameha I became king of all Hawaii and founded the Kamehameha dynasty. Okay. So let's go back a second. Mm hmm. They fought with spears and muskets, which implies. Yes, Kamehameha wasn't just a talented warrior, he was also a great statesman. He cultivated international relationships and glad-handed foreign officials to keep European powers happy, letting Great Britain, France, the United States, and Russia all believe that they had a very special relationship with Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the muskets, they came from a man named George Vancouver who had sailed, as I said, under Captain Cook in 1778 and 1779. But then he returned himself, bravely, in 1792, bringing new plants, animals, and firearms to the islands. Yeah, uh uh-uh, that man has way more balls than I do. Why would you go back? He just, again, I don't understand how that situation got resolved so easily. I would not be as forgiving. Maybe Cook was not as great as we think. Maybe there was a mutiny brewing anyway. I don't know. But let me tell you what. My butt would not have gone back. It was paradise. Mm -mm. Well, he did. And along with the first cow that he brought, which would go on to father a very profitable cattle industry, Vancouver also brought guns. And though he had a noted personal disbelief in trading of arms... Evidently, he broke his own rule out of friendship for Kamehameha in an effort to help him defeat the other island's warring chiefs. Because they had such a special relationship. Exactly. I don't know how Kamehameha felt about George Vancouver, but Vancouver was positive they were besties. In fact, he actually helped Kamehameha resolve a personal dispute with his favorite wife. His f- I mean- with his favorite wife, and arranged for him to get a British armed man of warship as a gift from the British government. I mean, my gosh, an arms dealer and a therapist, one-stop shop. That's a special kind of friend. Uh Mm Uh-huh. Hey, I think I was a bestie too. It's hard to say what Kamehameha thought, but he was very good at cultivating relationships, especially, it's especially exciting and surprising considering he came from a society that had absolutely no outside influences up until he was in his 20s. Oh, wow. Or later. It's brand new. They have never seen any of these things. And he's like, all right, this has potential. I'm going to roll with this. It's impressive. He is called Kamehameha the Great. That's true. And he made a number of great friends along the way, such as two British sailors whom he technically captured. Okay, that does not sound great. Well, okay, but he did reward them with marriages to royal Hawaiian women and made them chiefs. Um, not great, but the best option for a kidnapping scenario, I feel. That's fair, yeah. Raise me to be a deity? Okay. Their descendants did go on to rule Hawaii, so... Certainly could have been worse. I think it's interesting that, uniquely, the Hawaiians did not seem to have any problem with interracial marriage. Really? They were very open yeah. to this new world, this these new opportunities, this new culture, they did not seem to bother them. I mean, they had Russians coming in, Americans, Brits, French, and they were like, cool, okay. And like you said, to have previously such isolationist policies to just- Well, they didn't have isolationist policies. They didn't know. They only knew of the islands. They warred amongst themselves. They didn't, they didn't have contact with the outside world because they didn't know it was there. Ah, uh, I see. 
not because they were being isolationist. Unlike Japan. They knew and were just like, don't talk to me. No, no, we're going to be insular. So this was a very different approach. You can't sit with us. Oh, speaking of, men and women can't sit together when they eat in Hawaii. Oh. Well, according to Kapu. So anyway, these British sailors, or now Hawaiian chiefs, acted as his political and military intermediaries. He used their knowledge, their language, and their skills to help him understand this Western world of trade, negotiation, and warfare. But while he was very progressive in a lot of ways, he was still an autocratic ruler, absolutely no democracy, and he held true to the ancient ways. He venerated the old deities, and of course, he kept Kapu. Okay. Under his shrewd leadership, Honolulu Harbor exploded with trade. I mean, from zero to 160 seconds. But as we've seen in so many other historical tales, with trade comes disease. I get the feeling we're going to have a plague. Of sorts, yeah. Ish. Previously, the Hawaiian people had been almost disease-free as they'd been isolated for nearly a millennium. So... Okay. Pretty much all the germs had run through. But now, venereal disease ran rampant. Measles and other European diseases plagued the Hawaiian population. And those that survived the illnesses were often struck down by liquor or firearms. David Swanson from the University of California estimates that 1 in 17 Native Hawaiians died within just two years of Cook's arrival. Holy cow. By 1800, 22 years after Cook arrived, the population had declined by 48%. Oh my wait, god. Wait for it. By 1820, so 40 years later, it had declined by 71%. And by 1840, the Hawaiian population was diminished by 84%. That's unreal, man. These numbers are crazy. I've never seen any numbers like this before. Yeah. It was... Devastating. Almost a complete wipeout. And I think, honestly, the population is lucky that they survived. So while the foreign powers were getting rich off of Hawaii's trade industry, the native Hawaiians were literally dying in droves. By 1920, the native Hawaiian population was under 24,000 people. Oh my gosh. A slight happy side note, the population has since rebounded. There's obviously been a lot of interracial marriage and lots of babies, but the Hawaiian population continues to grow, and as of 2015, more than 560,000 Americans claim to be at least some part Native Hawaiian. So the race didn't recover, but it, it did find its way, it's clawing its way back. It's not nothing. Could have been worse. Kamehameha I was, as we said at the very beginning, not meant to be king. Though royal, he was not Ali'i Nui, or the most noble bloodline. Rather, he was born to a lesser chief, and therefore his entire dynasty was founded on fathers of lesser nobility who then married higher-ranking wives, slowly trying to crawl back up that noble birth chain. Well, it's kind of nice to see women having some sort of value but i guess it's still the same women the chief Mm. chief s's they do have far more power than you would think so while the stratified situation of kapu is really rigidly enforced it is not indicative of women's importance especially of royal women's importance does that make sense yes okay they can't eat together But the women and what they say is very respected all the same. Okay. It was more like it's not clean for us to eat together than it is it's not clean for me to eat near you. Mm. And so here we have Kamehameha founding a new dynasty, but the ranking system, Kapu, still there. Kamehameha himself had five wives, multiple wives being quite common amongst Hawaiian royalty. Actually, I saw that Wikipedia lists 11 spouses. I don't know about the other six, but you know what? In the end, we're only going to talk about two of them. So we'll just let him have his His little mini harem. (laughs) Oh, just wait. Oh, God. His highest ranking wife was Keopuolani. Her father was Kiwaalo, the cousin whom Kamehameha had killed for the throne. Oh, my. And her mother was Queen Keku Iapoewa Liliha the half-sister of Kamehameha. 
That, uh, uh-huh. that makes my brain hurt. She was described in history books as his quote-unquote niece wife, but she was also his first cousin once removed. I really hope this is not the favorite wife. No, it's not. Okay. It's just the most noble. Okay. Fair enough. There we go. I'm going to take a minute to talk about incest. (laughs) You? Which we all know is one of my favorite topics. It's just fascinating how... Maybe it's because you're an only child. I think what it is, is that... And I read a couple of psychology papers on incest when I was doing the research into this. Because most cultures do not believe in incest. It is something that most cultures just naturally decide against Mm -hmm. because it feels icky yes the same is said with animals that most species choose not to because biologically it's not good we know from the Habsburg jaw that bad things happen when intermarriage just gets crazy Uh but royal cultures like incest because it keeps the bloodline pure for example in hawaii Incestuous relationships were very common amongst the nobility, but the commoners would not have done this. It is something that is just about creating this link, this genealogy. The word incest does not exist in the Hawaiian language, but obviously, as we saw at the beginning, incestuous relationships are at the very core of Hawaiian myths and legends. Daddy, daughter, divine couple. Birth to Hawaiians people. You know. Yeah. Most Polynesian societies preferred intra-status marriages, i.e. you only marry your own rank, your own kind. But Hawaiian royalty took this to the extreme. For high-ranking chiefs, special care was taken to select the nearest possible relative for a wife. Not just a near relative, but the nearest. The nearest. What would you think that could be, Erica? I mean, a sister? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah. Yeah. For most men, that would be their sister or their half-sister because they had multiple wives and husbands. Oh, my gosh. And so it's hard to say exactly, but brother-sister marriages were regarded as the highest degree of nobility. So if you have most high-ranking marrying most high-ranking, they make baby that would actually be considered divine, equal to the gods, and of the highest possible kapu rank. Well, how did they explain that after generations of inbreeding and then they're just not the sharpest tool in the shed? I had that same question. I could not find that to be an issue. Mm. I'm sure it was. Next week, we will see a lot of childless couples. Can't imagine why. From half-brother and half-sister relationships or cousins or nieces or whatever. But that's not covered before. Remember, no written language. So we just don't know how many problematic births they had. The fact that their culture talks about this daddy-daughter fetus that was born unformed and became the taro plant does suggest that they had some knowledge of fetuses being born irregularly. Hmm. So maybe it was more common because of this. I just don't know. Hmm. I did read something that said that the Hawaiian men chose to marry their sisters In part to make sure that they kept the royal bloodline only Ah. to themselves. Because if they are of the highest kapu and so is sister and then they marry someone slightly less and sister marries someone slightly less, kids are equal. And now their kid isn't guaranteed it could be sister's kid. Because male and female genealogy was looked at. It wasn't just from the male point of view. It was both. I got it, I got it, I got it. I think there's some of all of those things in there. But back to Kamehameha's niece wife. She was extremely powerful, despite her gender, because she had the most noble blood. Keo Puolani was also the mother of his first son and heir, Liho Liho. He also had a favorite wife, Ka Ahumanu, who was beautiful and encouraged him to unify the islands via war. So they really got along well, they kind of thought together. And because she was his favorite, Kamehameha gave Enhanai, his firstborn son, Liho Liho, to her. And Liho Liho would go on to one day be king. Okay, what is this Hanai and giving of children? Hanai is a fascinating aspect of Hawaiian culture, and it means adoption, but not in a rigid sense. You know the phrase, you can't choose your family? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, in this case, you kind of can't. Ish. Okay. Instead of giving away children, it's more like sharing. Upon birth, most royal babies, and many common babies as well, not that 
any baby is common. They're all special and perfect. They would be given in Hanai to adopted families. Often blood relatives, think uncles, cousins, but sometimes just connections of friendship. And it was binding for life. They were considered to be a child of their foster parents. They would be treated the same as the biological children of those parents. So you kept some, you Hanai some. Ancient Hawaiian tradition states the biological parents would say, quote, yours is the child, excreta, intestines, and all. Well, there you have that. I think it's much more beautiful in Hawaiian Mm -hmm. because it doesn't sound it here. But while they were raised as biological children by their Hanai family, they still maintained contact with their biological family. It's all about expanding one's nuclear family and it strengthens relationships between family members because Mm -hmm. if you're sending your kid to be raised by your brother, then you and your brother will remain closer, probably communicate more than you would otherwise. Sure. As I said, it wasn't just for the ali'i, kings to farmers. The Hawaiian culture really embraced Hanai. Well, I mean, it takes a village. With the exception of some of these ali'i, if it was a commoner practice, it's probably like three doors down. It wasn't that far. You could still see the kid regularly. Right. You're not going across island or to a different island. As Hawaii's final monarch said, Hanai, quote, seems perfectly natural to us. This alliance by adoption cemented the ties of friendship between the chiefs. It spread to the common people, and it has doubtless fostered a community of interest and harmony. Yeah, I think this is a really beautiful part of the culture. I like it. I don't know that I could do it Mm. from a modern standpoint, but the thing is, that's not, we can't view it through our lens. Yeah, exactly. However, I was able to find a study about contemporary cases of Hanai. While it is not as common today, it is still practiced in Hawaii. Oh, look at that. Again, not often. I think it's special case-by-case basis. But one Hanai child who is now an adult said that it made him, quote, more complete, knowing I was raised and loved by so many as if I were their own. And then he corrected himself and said, quote, I am their own. I belong to them all. Oh, that's that's wonderful. It's a lovely thing. That makes thing. me want to cry. Oh, Look at that. In 1819, Kamehameha the Great, the uniting monarch, died. And his eldest son, one of his 13 children, ascended the throne as Kamehameha II. You know what? I'm already upset with this. Do not go the, the same name route. I just want to be able to tell you apart. Oh, oh girl, just wait. Kamehameha the first is followed by the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth all in a row. Oh, guys. Not helpful, people. Especially without a written language. That just makes it way more confusing. Kamehameha the second was the son of the great and the most noble of the great's wives, Keopuolani. He had been hanaid from birth to the favorite wife, Kaahumanu. However, while his bloodline was royally thick, he was not made of the same stuff as his father. Well, if that blood is that thick, it's not going to flow right. (laughs) What? (laughs) Think about it. If you've got thick blood, it's going to clot. You could also just say that, you know, niece wife wasn't a great idea. Sure. Yeah. He is generally described as unstable, dissolute, weak, and ineffectual. Well, there you have it. Yep, that's quite a list of adjectives. Mm -hmm. As he stood in the traditional red and yellow feather regalia, by the way, red and yellow feathers were kapu to any but the chiefs. Mm. Just a little example. Swearing himself to his people, his father's widow, the favorite Ka'ahumanu, his Hanai mommy, stepped forward and claimed his father, Kamehameha the Great, had actually really wanted her to rule. And so maybe they could just, you know, be kind of co-rulers. Now, Erica, if you were mid-coronation in your finest regalia and your stepmom walked up on stage, stopped the ceremony and claimed your dead dad actually wanted her to rule, what would you do? It would not be nice. No. Not be nice at all. I'd be mad. It is a Taylor Swift, Kanye West moment. It is. It is. And I'm... Mm -mm. Uh -uh. uh-uh thank you there would be an internet backlash to to no to no end the hawaiian gossips must have gone crazy but he did nothing what kamehameha ii made absolutely no objection 
just kind of nodded, and instead he immediately split his power and named Ka'ahumanu his Kuhina Nui, or Vice King. Well, that is something I was not expecting. No, I... This would not be what I would do. But this woman had raised him. I mean, it, stepmom, but also Hanai mom. Still. It's very Catherine de' Medici. It is. He then further divided his power with the other chiefs who saw this and instantly recognized weakness. And they were like, boom, we're going to need a share of the valuable sandalwood trade profits. And he was like, okay. Holy cow. And then his biological mother also stepped in for her slice of the pie. So in the end, Kamehameha II ruled alongside his most noble mommy and his most aggressive stepmom. Well, that does not bode well for Kamehameha. No, rock in a hard place, this guy. Mm -hmm. The first thing that these powerful women did was convince their son slash stepson that the kapu system, the rules and regulations Hawaiians had followed for more than a thousand years, really just needed to go. Yep, yep. I can't disagree. Gotta agree. One fateful evening at a feast in Kailua, weeks after his ascendance to the throne, and in front of the ali'i and foreigners, 22-year-old mm. Kamehameha II simply sat down in an empty chair at the women's table and began to eat. Oh my god! And that, as we say, is that almost... Instantly, the rigid kapu system was gone. As if by this one small action, Kamehameha II had erased a thousand years of strict social structure and hierarchy. Idols and temples were abandoned, old ways ignored, food eaten. I'm sure the women were like, holy crap, this is what a yeah. banana tastes like? That would have been my first priority. Hawaiian traditional culture basically completely collapsed. <gasps> Oh my god. It was a really big chair to It was pick. a really big deal, considering he just sat down at the next table. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. And this left Hawaii with a religious power vacuum. This was how they lived their lives. And now, nearly overnight, the Hawaiian people just lost their culture. Poof. Oh my god. And so what did they do? <laughs> Fortunately... Or not so fortunately, depending on your point of view, the Protestant missionaries literally floated in on the tides. Their timing could not have been more perfect or, well, more divine. Divine. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. The Hawaiian people, newly set adrift by the overthrow of their religion and culture, were the perfect audience for these devout missionaries who were, you know, here to help. Okay, but here's what I want to know. Okay. He did that. And I understand that you follow your king or whatever, but I'm really kind of surprised that people didn't like... This also meant that if they accidentally saw him, they wouldn't be clubbed to death. That's true. And that's great. That's wonderful. Great. But, uh... So, Kapu, I think for the average person, it gave them stability in knowing where they stood. But this is 40 years after Hawaii has opened to the Western world. They have a lot of British and U.S. nationals living there now. So right. they're seeing a very different interaction between men and women. Right. They're watching a merchant class come in because the people that are coming to Hawaii from other areas are not kings and queens. They are merchants. They are selling things. They might even be farmers. People are coming in that are making a ton of money and living lavish lifestyles with zero royal blood. And also no restrictions. There is no way these people were related to Haloa. Right. And they had no restrictions. If they saw the king, they weren't going to get clubbed to death. Right. The woman could sit down with her kids and have dinner, and that was not a thing. Mm -hmm. Kamehameha II was weak. Yeah. And his mom and his stepmom were super powerful. Right. But I think women were ready for this to go. Yeah, I want pork. Which we can see why. The crushing of the gods and everything else, I find really interesting that it couldn't maintain some, but not all. But I think Kapu was so intrinsically part of the creation myth. Right. From the beginning. If you're gonna get, get rid of one, you gotta get rid of all. He took out the foundation, the foundation. and then everything else just toppled. Okay, yeah. fair enough. King Kamehameha II actually became a devout Protestant pretty quickly after the missionaries arrived. Although he never officially converted because he refused to renounce all of his wives. I mean, Though he did have a favorite whom uh -huh. he said was his true wife, but the others still got to be there. 
And he didn't want to give up alcohol. Priorities. Again, okay. He created missionary schools and insisted that all royal children be educated like Westerners. He required them to read and write in English. Mm -hmm. And they went to the chief's school, which was specifically for chief's child relatives. Because, of course, there's a lot of degrees of relationships here. Well, there you go. At the same time, the printing press arrived, and that finally put the Hawaiian language into print. Kamehameha II's Kuhina Nui, his vice king slash stepmom, she also converted, but she too refused to give up her two husbands, the king of Kauai and his son. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I have questions. I have so many questions. None of them are, none of them are podcast-able. No, but they're still there. They're still there. Like, why? So if someone has answers to these questions that are still there, do let us know. Uh-huh. The Pithy Chronicle at gmail.com. <laughs> In 1819, the whaling ships also arrived, and they just kept on coming. A weak monarch, Kamehameha II, enabled the government's abuse of power. As king, he could give and take land freely, which he did. A lot, and usually on a whim. Hawaiians and foreigners alike were victims of his caprices. And unlike his father, Kamehameha II was unsure how to maintain a special relationship with multiple foreign entities. In particular, the American and British nationals, who were these wealthy merchants that wanted duty-free trade with their home nations so that they didn't pay taxes, Mm -hmm. developed very strong and very destructive rivalries that would start to tear the island Mm -hmm. and even the ali'i, the royalty, apart in different directions. In 1823, at just 26 years old, Kamehameha II and his favorite wife, his half-sister, Kamamalu, yeah, mm, set sail for England, accompanied by many other noble-blooded chiefs and chiefesses. It was the first international trip for the Kamehameha dynasty. And the last? No, it'll be his last, but not everyone. That's what I figured. Yeah, no, others will go, but he won't come back. Six months later, they arrived in Portsmouth and headed for London, and needless to say, their arrival was met with extreme curiosity, in no small part due to their large stature. Queen Kamamalu herself was over six feet tall. Oh, wow. Even though this is only 200 years ago, people generally were shorter back then, so everybody was like, look it up. Oh, God. Uh They toured the capital, attended the opera, went to the ballet, and had their portraits painted. Is there any surviving... Yes, there is a surviving portrait. Reaction? Like, what did they think of it, you know? No, we don't know that. Because a month into their visit, they were scheduled to meet King George IV, but it was postponed because Kamamalu became ill with measles. And it quickly spread to the entire Hawaiian court abroad. And just like their subjects before them, their lack of immunity proved fatal. Oh dear. Queen Kamamalu died two weeks later, and her grief-stricken husband, King Kamehameha II, followed. Mm. The young couple's bodies were returned to Hawaii, and because they had no children, it was the king's younger brother who would now step onto the throne, becoming King Kamehameha III. Yeah, I know. Okay, there we go. I think it is, in some ways, pretty poetic that the weak Kamehameha died abroad, just as his kingdom teetered precariously upon these rocky relationships that he'd created with numerous interested foreign powers. Well, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't think, oh, they definitely killed him on purpose. How did they not? I think because some of the royal court survived measles, so they were able to return and be like, no, we just got sick. Mm. Why they didn't think they'd catch it when, at this point, 71% of their population had died, I don't know. One of the things you have to think about with these kings and with the dynasty, we obviously know it's rising now, but it's it's going to fall here in just a second, is that they are doing well with the trade. They're bringing people in, but their population, their people are gone. Yeah. 71% of a population is dead by this point. So... That's one of the ways the Kapu system could fall, because clearly right. it's hard to maintain the same belief system when your entire world has literally been killed. Yeah. 
Kamehameha III was just nine years old when his brother died, and we all know how well that usually works out. <laughs> Kamehameha II's weakness and his destruction of the old ways left a power vacuum that just couldn't be filled by a young prince. And next week, we'll hear how it slowly begins to fall apart. Wait. What? That's the cliffhanger you're leaving me on? Yeah. That's a big cliffhanger. <laughs> Till next week, I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we are Pithily Yours. This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!